Hi everyone, we're going to get started um, with our webinar. Um, I just want to say hello to all of our attendees as we are getting started with this next installment uh, in the Campus Compact's National Webinar Series. My name is Marijo Morales and I serve as the Vice President for Network Leadership for Campus Compact. Um, we're so happy that uh, Ken and Erica could be part of uh, this National Webinar Series with um, their webinar on place-based community engagement in higher education. Um, our two talented colleagues, Erica and Ken. Uh, Erica serves as the program director and Ken as the associate, uh, and, uh, sorry, Erica serves as the program director and associate professor and Kent Koff serves as the director uh, for the center of the Center for Community Engagement, both at Seattle University. Uh, thanks so much to both of you for, for being here. Um, so before I get started with introductions and turning over the webinar for you all, um, I'd like to um, just remind folks that um, we have additional webinars in our series that are coming up in the coming months. So um, if you have an opportunity, if you haven't signed up yet, please go to compact.org and you can see um, the next few webinars in our series and sign up if you haven't had a chance. If you weren't able to make any of the previous webinars, we also have those available on our website. You can see videos um, as well as materials that were part of those webinars. In addition to that, I want to plug the Compact Nation uh, podcast uh, series. Um, it's a bi-weekly podcast where we tackle different issues in the field. Uh, I co-host it with our president, Andrew Seligson, and our director for Iowa and Minnesota, Emily Shields. Uh, we have fun, talk about different topics, um, and we welcome all of you to check out our podcast, Compact Nation. You can find it on any podcast listening uh, app you enjoy. So, Okay. Dr. Erica Yakamura is a program director and associate professor of the Student Development and Administration program uh, in the College of Education at Seattle University. As a faculty member, she has utilized service learning and community-based projects as part of her pedagogy at Carleton College, Texas State University, and Seattle University. For the last eight years at Seattle University, she has engaged in project-based learning in her required student development theory course one of the few in the country that utilizes this pedagogy in graduate education in the field of student affairs. In addition to her teaching and scholarly activities, Dr. Giacomara has prior experience as a practitioner in the field of community engagement. She served as site coordinator at a Title I majority uh, Latino, uh, Latina school in Los Angeles Unified School District, working with industry, community organizations, and local colleges to build an academic mentor program on campus. Welcome, Erica. And uh, Huff, good friend, is the founding director of the Seattle University Center for Community Engagement. In this role, uh, Kent has overseen a rapid expansion of community, uh, campus community partnerships and has received national recognition. As an adjunct faculty member and SU, interdisciplinary liberal studies program. Ken has taught courses focusing on leadership and community engagement. With support from the Annie Casey Foundation, uh, Ken is currently leading an effort to create a national network of universities pursuing place-based community engagement. Um, and as you could tell from the materials that we sent out, they just came out with the book. Um, we're so excited around the topic. Um, this webinar has gotten the most uh, registrations of any of our webinars in the series. So we're really excited to hear what you have to share with us uh, today. So Eric and Kent, it's all yours. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, I need to unmute you. There you go. Yeah. We're just going to pull up uh, some slides we're going to use for our session. Um, I will go, uh, let me describe a little bit about what we're going to do today in terms of our agenda. We, um, we're wanting to provide some framing of an overview of uh, community engagement and um, a background of the book project that we have um, just completed. We also uh, plan to share some case studies and lessons uh, and considerations from a couple of the institutions in the study that we um, have conducted. And then we're going to conclude with some implications for the field as a whole in terms of things that we have learned from place-based community engagement 
and how that uh, some considerations for us all collectively um, for Campus Compact and for, kind of for all, all of us at our respective institutions and in our communities. A couple of things that I'll mention, just some logistics. There are, there are several points in our presentation where we will have some polls so you'll have the opportunity to respond to a couple of questions and we'll see in real time the responses to the polls we also have built in a couple of points in our presentation where we'll respond to questions and if you use the chat feature through um, this interface through the zoom interface you can ask questions um, you can ask questions at any time we'll be looking at them and when we pause for those questions we'll respond to them as much as we can so uh, why don't we move into our first poll. All right, um, so we'd love to get to know who's on the call. So what's your current experience with a place-based strategy? You should be seeing on your screen right now uh, three different uh, ways to respond. You're currently implementing a place-based strategy, currently exploring a place-based strategy, or currently, uh, or just curious about place-based work. And, and please make sure to use the Q&A function for the questions. Uh -huh. That'll help us. Well, this is exciting. We have a audience, 40% of you um, showed that you're curious about a place-based strategy. Um, about 28% are implementing. Um, and about 11% are currently exploring. So it's, an, it's nice to have a range of folks um, that are here for different reasons. So we're gonna move into the background of the book now and how the book came about. Nationally, over the course of the past 15 or 20 years, there have been different models that have arisen that have focused intensely on a geographic area, most notably the, the Harlem Children's Zone uh, in Harlem in New York for the past 20 years has been focused on initially, um, uh, Jeffrey Canada who, leads that, who has led that work initially on a seven block radius in Harlem and it's grown to 100 square blocks. The federal government during the Obama administration then started to uh, replicate the Harlem Children's Zone model through some funding strategies, Promise uh, Neighborhoods and Choice Neighborhood Grants through the Department of Education and Housing and Urban Development. And on our end, we started exploring um, some curiosities that we were seeing when we started hosting different institutions here in Seattle, learning about the work that we were doing here in Seattle. We uh, partnered Erica and I on some white papers um, related to those convenings that were simply looking at what were we learning from our local context here. That led to um, a conversation about Erica's sabbatical um, and what that might look like, a year-long sabbatical that occurred a little over a year ago, and um, then led to the creation of this book. Excellent. So our primary audience for this book is for practitioners, um, in particular, community service and community engagement professionals. We explored the landscape, the national landscape of place-based work, and we, we began with about 35 institutions that were doing place-based strategies. Um, from there, we eliminated um, institutions that were already showcased. Some of you may have seen the Hodges et al. book. Um, so we narrowed down to about 25. And then we really wanted to look at institutions that had utilized this strategy and had been doing it for a couple of years. Um, so we narrowed it down to about 15. And from there, we went to five. Um, we really wanted our final institutions to reflect geographic diversity, institutional type diversity, um, and have some unique experiences as well. As you can see from our slide, we utilized a multiple case study approach. Um, we did lots of fun and nerdy things like document analysis. We also reviewed strategic plans um, and honor roll applications for all but one of the institutions. Um, I think the most fun part 
was actually visiting these institutions. If you're doing place-based work, you need to go out into the field and actually experience what that place looks, feels, um, sounds, and sometimes smells like. Um, so we went to, we observed, we visited all five institutions and we engaged in a variety of one-on-one, -on -one, small group um, conversations with about 95 different stakeholders. Um, for those of you who are methodology nerds or faculty members, we also engaged in member checking because we wanted to make sure our analysis um, was developing and we also provided our emergent analysis to our key stakeholders to make sure that um, we were checking our biases. All right, we're going to move into what is place-based engagement. Um, about 40% of you were curious, so here is our working definition. A long-term university-wide commitment to partner with local residents, organizations, and other leaders to focus equally on campus and community impact within a clearly defined geographic area. Sounds exciting, right? Um, from there, we distill some key concepts. So the first piece is that you must identify and focus on a geographically bound space. Um, too often, community service, community engagement offices are willing to partner with anyone anywhere. But this approach really allows you to hone in on an area and have measurable impact. Um, a second key concept is equal emphasis on campus and community impact. Um, service and engagement offices that are located on a university campus traditionally focus on campus impact, right? We're a university campus. So what does that mean? Student engagement, faculty engagement, um, and staff engagement, often looking at both quality and quantity. Um, and some of our national honors and recognitions also seek this information. Um, but campus impact is super important. We found that community impact is equally important, um, in particular students, family, and partner outcomes. Um, and, and reaching this equal emphasis of community and campus impact um, really requires folks to value community in new ways um, with de deep relationships, um, new types of metrics, and even different styles of communication. Long-term vision and commitment is another key component. Um, given the intentional geographic focus and the equal emphasis on campus and community impact, an institution has to be in it for the long haul. And we're not talking one, two, or three years. We're talking 20 plus years. Um, Place-based engagement is also not just one program or one office. It's a coordinated university-wide strategy. Um, so for mission-based institutions, this can mean living out the mission or contributing to the mission. Um, for public institutions, you can develop capacity for community-based research or other large types of grants. But really, it's this university-wide piece that's important. Um, and lastly, it's really important to note that an office or an individual can't do it themselves. Um, so place-based work really draws upon um, the concept of collective impact in that we are stronger by working together on off campus and intersectionally. So the five institutions um, we ended up looking at um, are Drexel, Loyola, University of Maryland, San Diego State, Seattle U, and the University of San Diego. Um, this is a brief snapshot of the different initiatives. Um, each institution had a unique community focus and initiative. Um, so we focus on these five institutions in the book, but for this webinar, we're really going to focus on Drexel and Seattle University. Now that we've shared our definition, some key concepts to get you grounded in place-based community engagement, we're gonna share the three phases that emerged when we went out and visited these sites and learned from these communities. Um, first, we found that institutions who were um, doing place-based community engagement, there's a first phase. Um, the end of this phase is typically at a institution when you decide you're gonna move forward with a place-based community engagement initiative or not. Um, in this phase, there's often some type of catalyst. catalyst. Um, leadership matters, especially at the executive level. Um, there's a lot of engaging campus and community, listening sessions, meetings, and, and really exploring possibilities. At this point, you have not yet committed to an initiative. You're just really um, listening to learn. Uh, there's also a geographic consideration. What 
how are you going to identify and explore place? Um, and then you have to also look within your organizations. What do organizational systems and structures look like? What could work with a place-based initiative? And what are some ways in which you know, additional questions or need areas emerge? So once an institution has decided, yes, we're gonna pursue place-based community engagement, moves into the development stage. Um, this is a fun period of experimentation and relationship development. Lots of innovation and opportunity for programs and partnerships. Um, we heard on, on our campus visits, it's like throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, typically, resources and funding, there's a lot of energy into increasing capacity in those areas. Many um, institutions uh, began if they hadn't already been fundraising. Um, and organizational structures and personnel also um, begin to move a little bit because you're building an infrastructure for something that your campus and communities have not yet done before. So different types of positions um, and opportunities emerge. Now, once a place-based community engagement initiative um, gets through this developmental phase um, and is working to sustain its efforts, it falls into the final stage. If you can see, there's no end stage, right? This is about long-term partnerships. So it's about sustaining and, and really looking at how an initiative matures. Um, so geographic considerations um, for a place-based initiative, how does the initiative respond to neighborhood change. There, there's a lot of gentrification occurring um, and communities don't stay stagnant, right? People change, the politics change. Um, and so how does an initiative respond to that? You might've created some new programs or partnerships in that developmental stage. You might've enhanced or kept some, um, but the key question in this stage is about how do you move toward being sustainable? right, with partnerships and programs? How do, how do you develop a portfolio um, and an understanding with communities that is mutually beneficial? Resources and funding, this is a key area of maturation. Um, and also stability, what types of funding is soft funding? What types of funding comes in from the university? And how does that get managed in the long haul? And then lastly, when you're looking at organizational structures and personnel, what does secession look like? Um, we know in higher ed, folks don't stay in positions forever these days, right? Um, so what does secession and change management look like, especially as it relates to personnel? So we're at a point now where we would welcome questions using your Q&A um, uh, feature of the Zoom uh, call. Um, and we can kind of see if there's questions that come in. I will maybe start with one question that is commonly asked, has been commonly asked, of our work in Seattle and certainly at the other institutions that we profiled in the book. One of those questions is when you're focusing on a geographic area, what happens to the partnerships that don't fall within that, the, the existing partnerships that the university has that don't fall within that uh, geographic area? And that is one of the strategic choices as a university focuses on a neighborhood because they know they can make more impact um, and try to measure that impact perhaps sort of the pursuing the place-based work uh, also is a way of having the university have more of a narrative and more of a visibility. It does come with choices. For at CLU, one of the ways that we responded to that has been to continue uh, a number of the existing partnerships that are outside the neighborhood through our service learning structures, through our course-based structures, particularly because some of those link with course objectives. Um, an example is there's a major waterway called the Duwamish here in Seattle and we have some faculty that are doing research on the toxicity of the water um, and how to clean it up. It, it's not within our place-based work, but we continue to support it. But we have uh, the new resources that have come to the university. And as we work with faculty around research questions, when they approach our office um, in a sort of centralized way, we're directing them into the, uh, our local neighborhood. In a moment, uh, as we go into the case studies, I can describe more about what's occurring here in Seattle and Erica will describe more about uh, what's occurring in Drexel. Uh, do we have questions? We do. So we have a question from Gavin, that, and Gavin asks, to what extent do you get the sense that universities understood the history of the university's involvement in that neighborhood? That is an excellent question. Yeah. I think what, for uh, at least from my vantage point, I'd be curious, Eric, for your, your take on this. Uh, in moving into a place-based work, it, it becomes very a very different approach 
uh, that that becomes more complex, messy, in many ways, much more from my vantage point, much more rewarding because it is engaging place and not just engaging an organization. Often as universities were partnered with specific organizations and the staff there and the people that they're working with and the mission that they're focused on. But we don't ever kind of, don't ever think of what's the context and the history of that place. And so neighborhood work, uh, place-based work often calls uh, one calls institutions um, and to do this well, um, it requires looking backwards. What is the history of this neighborhood? Who are the, the, um, the natural leaders by role and who are the leaders who are by influence? Um, residents that are in the neighborhood and um, this sort of leaders that have led different uh, movements and different efforts. So I, um, I think in the explorations that we did with the five different um, profiles and uh, we found that each of those institutions had to over time better understand the context of the neighborhood they're working in and also understand the very reciprocal nature of the partnerships. Do you have a take on that? Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer that on two levels. So one, as a faculty member who does um, community-based research and graduate courses, I think the history is critical um, because the institution has been there for a long time and faculty, staff, college presidents turn over all the time. So when folks enter a campus, they enter with the current context, but there's a whole history that needs to be engaged. And, and as Kent mentioned, there's some uncovering that gets done, um, but it's also important to know what has happened in the past, whether you know administrators were on campus or students were there prior, there's a history that the community brings. Um, and to really understand that, or to really, tap into that history, whether it's through learning walks or attending different events or getting to know community members is really critical to understand the current context. Andrea has a question. Are there specific variations in the phases based upon institutional size and or size of the community? The, the five institutions that we looked at are, are some, there's some similarities between a few of them, but they're also quite different from San Diego State, which is a large public institution to Seattle U, which is a Jesuit Catholic institution, to Drexel, that is a larger private institution on the East Coast. Geography has a pretty big impact. I think what we found is that the, the phase, there's some natural phases, but how long an institution is in a given phase and um, what that looks like varies by institution. I don't know if you have sort of thoughts about the particular, in any of the institutions we work with. Yeah, I think it's up to the institution to decide. Um, and I think it's part of that planning process. Like what makes sense for your initiative and your institution? Are there existing relationships um, and communities that you wanna remain partner with? And you can see doing something intentional long-term um, and having that make sense. Um, another strategy we saw in Seattle U uses this as well, is that, um, within a community, if you're focused on youth or education, looking at school boundaries. Um, and if you wanna look at a pipeline, you're, you want an elementary, middle and high school within those boundaries. We also know that you know school boundaries change. So then what happens when those boundaries change? We've got some other good questions that we might be able to, to explore as we move into the case studies. Why don't we just name some of the questions? How do you make the case for the projects that are not revenue driven? but build place-based community. That's a very good one uh, for all of our work. Can a small city, six square miles, be your place or does the model emphasize neighborhoods within a city? And then we also have one from Buffalo State. How do you determine the goals of collaboration based on community need, strategic plan, et cetera? Um, we'll be able to answer some of those questions by moving forward in our presentation with the case studies. Um, and then we'll continue on with Q&A afterwards. So as I mentioned earlier, the two institutions that we'll be looking at for this webinar are Drexel University and Seattle University. Um, so Drexel University is located in uh, Philadelphia. Um, of all the institutions we visited, Drexel has developed the most rapidly with this place-based community engagement effort. If you look at the map that's on the screen, uh, Drexel is located in sort of the Philly Meds and Eds area. Uh, UPenn is down the street. Um, and as you can see, they utilized, Drexel is in the blue, and they utilized a university adjacent, adjacent approach. So their university is in the blue, and then the communities that they partner with are in the golden color and in the green color. 
So the blue highlights the campus building. So there's a main campus um, and there's another area here. And then please note this Dornsife Center. I'll come back to it um, when I share a little bit more about Drexel. In the green here is the Promise Zone, um, which is part of their initiative and it's a major federal grant with the federal government um, in the city of Philadelphia. And then in the golden area here, you have um, the parameters of their unique home purchase program that provides faculty and staff um, really innovative financing opportunities um, to invest not just as faculty and staff members um, on the university campus, but to actually live in the communities. So pretty neat. Um, so I'll share three key lessons learned. So at Drexel University, um, President John Fry came on board and in his inaugural address, he declared that he wished to make Drexel the most community engaged campus in the world. Um, clearly he had prior experience in community engagement, including in Philadelphia, and he's a widely recognized expert in this field. So when you have a president that sort of leads with this concept, um, we found that there's a lot of transformation that can take place. Um, and from that point, after um, his inaugural address, he appointed a senior vice provost of university and community partnerships. So a cabinet level position that reports directly to the president, that, that's a critical piece. This is not somebody that is a director of an office or at a remote site, but has a clear line to the president. Um, community engagement was also integrated into all facets of the university um, as a vehicle to drive institutional development. So we're talking faculty development grants, curriculum changes, um, you name it, community engagement um, was prioritized in that strategic approach. Another area that we found um, very promising are the curricular innovations that were taking place at Drexel. So if you are a first time full-time freshman at Drexel, you have a common experience and you are required to take a course that has service learning and community engagement embedded um, that is in the place-based community engagement area. They also have had an opportunity to pilot um, what's known as side-by-side -side courses where community members are actually taking courses with students. So when you're thinking about sort of this 90, 10, or sort of this equal community and campus impact. Imagine not just going to the community to learn, but actually learning with community members. Very powerful experience um, that we also saw at a couple of other institutions. And lastly, um, they are also working on college access, looking at a pipeline um, toward developing and enrolling community members at their institution. And for most universities, that is an area of capital and leverage um, that typically is not available to community members. And so that was one that um, we saw very promising as well. And finally, I wanted to share more about the Dornsife Center. So if we go back to the map, that's this area that's a little bit off campus, but still part of the campus community. Um, and it was such a unique intersectional space. It's a community center extension hub um, and I would say it's an example of what's possible when community engagement is a priority at the institution and strategically integrated into the institution um, and also well resourced. Um, it was made possible by a generous donor um, and it's an actual physical site where the campus comes to the community to engage together. We got to see uh, a computer lab where residents were there at all times of the day and and not just you know if you go to a public library folks kind of do their work a little bit some folks hang around but there was an, a, a vibe of community and ownership of place um, there was a library kiosk where you could come in and rent books and also iPads um, in partnership with the city of Philadelphia um, there was a kitchen space um, and I have a six-year-old daughter and she loves cooking classes and so it was really neat to see that there was a space where um, faculty and staff could collaborate to put on these kind of cooking courses and, and food making with the community. Um, we also heard about um, course development where community members, in particular youth, really wanted um, to do more with music and, and studio time so they built a studio um, within this facility and there's an opportunity for a faculty member to run a course 
um, with the community members. So lots of great things happening at Drexel University. I'll turn it over to Kent. So I'm going to describe now some of the background on Seattle University and the work that has been occurring here. I'm also going to try to weave in a couple of the questions that were asked. Um, one of the questions was around how do, do institutions and their partners set goals? Do they arise from the university, from that university strategic plan, or do they come from the community or, or both? Uh, some background on Seattle University. We are in the middle of um, Seattle. You can see here on the map the reddish area and you can those of you who have been to Seattle and maybe not to our campus, you can also see Pike Place Market up in the upper left-hand corner. Of the, um, it gives you sen a sense of uh, situation. It, we're about a mile um, to, to that site. So we are in the heart of the city. We, as a university, had been partnering with numerous organizations. There's probably 100 different nonprofits that are surrounding our campus that are walkable from here. In uh, 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, our, our president began a conversation with a couple members of our trustees. And the, the questions that were arising uh, were along the lines of Seattle University has a major commitment to the city and has do, is doing great work in engaging students through service learning and volunteerism and other forms of community engagement. If we were to focus on a topic or a particular issue or a neighborhood, could we make more of a measurable difference? And for us, that question with the initial encouragement from our president became a, a somewhat of an organizing strategy of um, asking internally, initially, what are, where are we currently partnered and creating some maps um, of uh, partnership maps by each of our colleges and schools, our business school, our College of Nursing, our College of Education, some of uh, our College of Arts and Sciences, all of our uh, colleges. And then also looking at what are the demographics, um, uh, the data that we could gather in terms of our city and our neighborhoods. And then a very significant process of listening, listening within our local neighborhoods and within the city. That led us after a, a two year planning process of internally organizing and externally partnering and organizing. It led to two things. One, um, a major conference that brought together 300 people from our campus and community that um, sought to both share information about what was occurring in our local neighborhoods on particular topics on education and on, on um, issues related to health and uh, safety and uh, other issues and then also invited those 300 people to offer insight to what the youth initiative what became known as the Seattle University Youth Initiative what it would become so that planning process culminated in, um, in the kind of the official launch of the youth initiative back in uh, 2010. I'm gonna go back to the map here for a moment and just talk a little bit about our neighborhood before I move into a couple of other lessons from our work. So this is a, about a two square, the, the lightly uh, shaded blue area here is a two square mile radius of the central part of Seattle. There are around 20,000 people that live in this neighborhood around a third of the people who live in this neighborhood are living at or below the poverty level and about half the uh, folks in the neighborhood are people of color it's a really rich uh, neighborhood in terms of its history and to the question earlier about understanding history and context um, for seattle u i think it's um, it's 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 become a uh, much a greater partnership because of the understanding of the history it includes our chinatown international district our uh, our historic home for our Japanese American, Vietnamese American, and Filipino American communities. Also, it includes a public housing community, Yesler Terrace, which is currently going through a redevelopment process. And then it includes a portion of our central district, which has been the uh, home of our African American community. We have chosen this uh, ge geography because the public schools in Seattle in 2010 moved towards a neighborhood assignment plan. And Bailey Gatchard School in the middle of the map here has one of the higher rates of uh, poverty in terms of children attending the school of any school in Seattle. And our partnerships as we map them, um, they populated very significantly in this local neighborhood with dozens of different uh, connections between the campus and community. So we chose this neighborhood at that time. And that was sort of lesson kind of as I reflect on lessons, the first lesson, we can go on to the next slide, the first lesson um, of being intentional in the planning process and then the choices is significant. In choosing a neighborhood, it did mean we were choosing to not focus in other neighborhoods, which did lead to uh, challenges along the way. But I 
but I think for us, the strategy of focusing has had a ripple effect in some very positive ways in the sense of having one narrative to share as a campus, to have deeper learning experiences for our students in the local neighborhood and for faculty to get to know uh, partners and residents over a period of time and for trust to build over many years because we're, we're not going anywhere in terms of this commitment. So, the, so being strategic and having a strategic approach is one of the lessons from our work. Um, the other uh, somewhat unexpected for us, um, positively unexpected, and it gets to the question of um, that the, uh, an individual asked uh, earlier around how do you balance um, the focus on mission uh, when there's not a revenue generating element of this. And what we have learned at the university is we've attracted new donors to our university because of this externally focused um, effort, particularly in our case, focusing on youth and children and particularly focusing on metrics like our third graders at, at grade, reading at grade level and our fourth graders uh, at, at grade level in math and um, our children prepared for, um, for kindergarten. And those metrics and that focus and on the sort of climate of the neighborhood and are the schools uh, a positive uh, space for residents, that has led to new individual donors and um, major foundations taking an interest in the university, trusting the university with their dollars and also trusting the university because of the strategy. Um, so it's been um, a way of growing out our work and um, deepening our work in the local neighborhood. And then the final thing that I would uh, reflect on is the managing the tensions and uncertainty that arise from place-based work. This is not, I would hope that through our presentation, there's no sense that this is linear. Um, even though our phases appear to be somewhat linear, it's really messy and it's really rich in that way. There are um, polarities that arise from this work, uh, polarities from, um, from the literature, and there's several different books that are written about polarities, are often defined as two good things that are um, in tension with each other. And if we overdo one, it damages the other, which ends up damaging the whole. So several different prominent polarities that exist in place-based work. One is obviously choosing the place and also engaging in other places. And for the institutions, that, for our institutions to be balancing that very intentional focus on place with an awareness that for a variety of reasons, we're likely to be involved in other places, whether they're local or around the country or around the world. Another is campus and community, and this is probably the most significant polarity in place-based work, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this presentation, that the polarities of focusing equally um, on campus and community creates tension where, our, where at times on our campus, there's a question of why you focus so much on external metrics. And also in our community at times, there's a question of why you focused on student learning when it's really on your college student learning. So it's balancing those two tensions. I've already mentioned mission and margin. Um, the awareness that most of our institutions, certainly Seattle U, is, in, uh, is tuition driven. And we need to be aware of sort of the margins um, and the, the awareness of finances, but also um, a, a commitment in our case that's sort of driven by our Jesuit Catholic uh, ethos, a commitment to empowering leaders for a just and humane world. A few other polarities, being bold with a vision but also grounded in humility in all of our actions and how we approach things. Overdoing one of those, particularly the boldness, um, can come across as bullish and um, prescriptive and many of the negative stereotypes of the ivory tower of institutions of higher education. The final two polarities that often surface are doing the work of the work in the neighborhood and doing our own work. And this is particularly related to issues, and in our case, related to race, and power dynamics that arise from class um, issues from our campus engaging in our local neighborhood. There's significant more work that we as individuals and our institutions need to do related to racism and classism. And we also need to be simultaneously doing the work of place-based work. The final polarity is being invitational and inviting, always inviting um, campus and community partners to come together and to connect, but also very purpose-driven where it's not so watered down and we're not bending to every kind of wish and hope um, as we're moving into place-based work. All right, we will get back to a poll. We wanna hear from you if you can use your, the polling function. So from these six lessons that we shared um, from Drexel and Seattle U, 
which might be of greatest interest to explore further. We're excited to hear um, what you all think. Yeah. When we've presented, we typically get a lot of interest in, I'd say, grant and fund development. Yeah. Um, and also university change process. Some of the big ones. We also see there are more questions coming in. Um, so just keep asking your questions. We'll finish up this poll here in a moment, um, move through a little bit more content and then turn back to uh, questions from you all. All right, we've got results of our poll here. Looks like there's a fair amount of balance. Uh, the, the value of, of an off-campus third space, 26% um, of you chose that. 21% leveraging place-based strategy to pursue new funding. Uh, and then we have uh, invitation to pursue curricular innovation, be planful and make choices and embrace polarities are 15, 16%. And the importance of presidential leadership is 5%. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's fascinating. Thanks for your um, for your insight there. Um, it's it's, it's in, interesting to see that sort of how uh, this is resonating with those of you who are on this Zoom call. So we're going to go a bit further into uh, the implications for our field as a whole. What does this approach of place-based work? Which um, I should also note that we. There are institutions that are moving. Seattle U in the past 10 years have moved in this direction. There are institutions historically that have been doing this work all along. And I think it would be important to name that um, many different institutions are place-based just by their very nature. Uh, HBCUs, Hispanic survey institutions, um, many community colleges, often institutions that are in more rural areas that are in um, maybe in a smaller town, is a more natural connection to place. But let's talk about uh, the implications for the field as a whole the, um, the reality of moving from what I would sort of, what I think we talk about is the 90-10 proposition to the 50-50 proposition. Within our field as a whole, there's often a very strong, much stronger emphasis on the college student learning, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, and a little often less emphasis on community impact and how we measure that and what, we're, what are our explicit goals uh, externally. And some of that's quite natural because this work is arising from faculty who are teaching service learning courses. And also because we as institutions of higher education have an sort of imperative to educate our students. The work of place-based community engagement pushes that more towards a 50-50 proposition of focusing on uh, impact on campus, student learning opportunities for faculty to do research, and also on uh, community impact, whatever those metrics would be. Our, and at Seattle U, it's particularly related to education and some housing metrics, but institutions that are pursuing this have multiple different things they're looking at. That creates a fair amount of tension and um, pushes uh, things in different ways. As an example, faculty who may be passionate about a particular discipline that there, or their particular research might be coming to the community and saying, and coming to sort of those involved in place-based work with, a, with the idea but because there's quick feedback loops and very significant community voice, the community may or may not say that they are interested in that work or that um, research. So there's much more of an opportunity for back and forth and for quicker feedback loops. Often institutions that are pursuing place-based work and are closer to this 50-50 proposition, they know when they're hitting the mark. They also know when they're not hitting the mark. And Often, if there's a central coordinating entity for CLU, it's our Center for Community Engagement. We know what's occurring across campus if someone, even if they're not connected to our work, if they've done great work or if they haven't. And we're being held accountable collectively for that. 
So that's a, it, it pushes us from individual courses and um, individual partnerships with uh, different organizations to more of a institution-wide commitment and connecting with neighborhoods, which can create um, tension and significant opportunities for institutional growth in looking at the partnering in the community. Excellent, excellent. Um, community service and community engagement offices have been slower to diversify than other pockets of campus, um, especially at the executive director and director level. Um, and especially with respect to racial diversity. Um, and I'll just share a personal experience. I mean, I've been connected to community engagement for almost 20 years at this point. And almost every conference or professional development setting I've been in, um, there are always one or some people of color, but it's a very, very small group. Um, and then when you look at the executive level, there are more women, but it's predominantly white and male. And that's a question we have to ask ourselves as a field. If we're going to be working in communities, especially racially diverse communities, but if we're not going to diversify our staffing and leadership, um, are we really doing our own work? Um, so there's definitely a need for more identity-based work of existing leadership. Um, Kent talked about that a little bit. Um, and I'd say in particular, white racial identity development of executive director and director level staff. Um, also intentionality in the hiring of staff, developing student staff, and mentorship pipelines. Um, Place-based community engagement allows us to do this work in communities and it can allow community members to raise critical issues and work through them in a safe way. Um, and I also want to say, and if this area with racial diversity and identity work is new or uncomfortable, you know, it's okay. Um, but to not engage, especially if you're at a director or executive director level, it means that you're being complacent and that you're contributing to, to maintaining systems of exclusion. Um, so it's super important to be able to address this area, um, especially as you continue to work in diverse communities. So that leads into the final implication for our field, which is the uh, recent work that Lena Destilio and colleagues have been doing on professional competencies for community engaged professionals. And to be thinking about um, particularly the two implications that we've uh, noted uh, here moving towards more 50-50 work in terms of impact, uh, campus and community, and also uh, the commitment to diversity and inclusivity and focuses on uh, anti-racism and other strategies. How those weave into our professional competencies as a field is quite significant. And I think place-based work helps to raise these questions and push, that, uh, push those edges. We're gonna turn now to more questions. Um, we've got some more questions that have come in we have a question around, um, can we provide some more specific examples of ways that students, faculty, administration are engaged in the neighborhoods and the case studies? Maybe we can tag team on that. Do you, you wanna offer? Sure, I mean, there's so many, so I'm, I'm trying to think. You know, one that comes to mind, and it's not from Drexel, but I'm gonna share it anyway, um, is with Loyola University, Maryland. They identified um, a fresh food need there, a food desert. Um, where their community is located. And so they work together with um, the local city council person, um, a nonprofit organization, and with the university to develop a um, oh, what is it called? farmer's market. I'm, like, I'm blanking. It's Seattle. I grew up in California. We have farmer's markets year round. Only in Seattle are they six months. Um, so in Baltimore, they developed a farmer's market for the community. So that addressed the food need, um, also entrepreneurial in spirit, um, and very, very collaborative in nature. Um, and there was a faculty member from the business school who was doing um, assessment and research on the types of um, uh, funding, or not funding, um, the folks who are using uh, WIC benefits and other benefits, um, and, and just being really innovative in that way as well. I would say another example is uh, San Diego State University's partnering in the City Heights neighborhood. They have uh, looked at their being very strategic about their practica sites for their social work students, masters in social work, and also their um, uh, students that are trained to be teachers in partnering in particular schools and with the, with the faculty spending a fair amount of time in those schools and in those um, neighborhoods to understand the context. So it's sort of a strategic uh, use of um, where students are doing their field placements. At Seattle U, what we have 
um, pursuit is how do our service learning courses connect with um, our neighborhoods. That often has meant more front end time with faculty in spending time in the neighborhood, understanding history and context and meeting with community partners, which um, we believe is leading to a better experience for our students in the classroom and deeper learning. We also think it makes more of an impact because then the faculty are able to instruct the students and help provide context. Right, Buffalo State has asked us a really interesting question. Have institutions run into conflict within the community when one neighborhood is the focus um, and other neighborhoods are not? Uh, we've been questioned both within the institution and outside the institution about a focus on our adjacent neighborhood and therefore have expanded our geographic focus area. Mm. That's a great question. I think that gets into that polarity of focusing on place and on other places. I think the, um, when I think of the five institutions that we profiled and then kind of our experiences directly here at CLU, frequently it's how we're communicating. Uh, I think when an institution is communicating uh, that if, we've, if we were to focus everywhere, we accomplish nothing in terms of impact because it's too watered down. We're being strategic, we're focusing on a particular area because we're focusing on impact. I think how different people who might bring critique hear that um, is, it might, might be different. It's certainly been um, the political nature of cities, um, and particularly here in Seattle, that's a, um, something that we need to share consistently, that we're being strategic, we're trying to have impact, we're trying to pursue measure, re measurable results. If we were to take on more of an expansive um, geographic focus, we may lose our ability to have impact. That, that doesn't eliminate the tension. Um, and, we, and I think most of these uh, institutions are being asked to partner in other neighborhoods. But I, I just would reiterate sort of the focus on strategy and being really strategic about impact is a way of um, at least mitigating some of that critique and tension. And I'll just add that I think of at all the five institutions, while there was a focus on the identified place, there were also um, still programs and partnerships outside of that area. So if you say you're place based, that doesn't mean that's all you do, right? It means the majority and, and how folks define that looks different. Um, for example, at uh, the University of San Diego, they had a long standing partnership um, with a community in Tijuana and they continued to maintain that piece. So you can, you can do that. But I think the question is if you're going to continue to expand or if you want to have another place-based initiative with the same tenacity and commitment as your current um, place, what do resources look like? What does capacity look like? Um, I think those are questions that need to be raised. We had a question a little while ago about um, geography and can we, can one, can place-based focus be in a smaller city or a smaller town? We've certainly, when we've done presentations and been in conversation with people from around the country, there have been questions of, does place-based uh, work lend itself to uh, rural communities? I think of Berea College and the work that's occurring um, in the communities around Berea and the um, Promise uh, neighborhood grant that Berea received as an example of an institution working in rural areas. Uh, I think that the, the principles of the work, if we go back to the definition of focusing on place and the 50-50 nature of impact and university-wide and collective impact, that's, that's portable to multiple different geographic contexts. For us, when we were looking at institutions, we did look at um, several dozen institutions. We lowered it down to these five, which happen to be in more urban areas, but this can occur in almost any context. You know, Kent, there was a question earlier about how, how do you make the case for projects that are not revenue driven, but build place based community. Yeah. Um, that that um, when I was mentioning kind of the, the role of fund development in this work and kind of the raising of um, new revenue. Uh, I, it does take a on the front end, it might take the institution an initial leap of faith that if they focus on place, it may lead to new revenue. For some of the institutions that we have, uh, that, we, that we looked at in our uh, case studies, when they started taking place more seriously, it led to government contracts and um, different new relationships with um, local uh, public institutions. But there is a, a pivot that needs to occur and some um, awareness that the, the, any new revenue doesn't necessarily occur uh, quickly. Some institutions, however, did pivot towards place-based work because they had an initial gift from one uh, person. 
and that helps them do the planning and the background work. We probably have time for one more question. I don't know if we have any more questions. Looks like we're, well, maybe we'll go on our final slide here. So stay in touch. Uh, we, we do have a, um, the, the book, Play-Based Community Engagement in Higher Education unpacks a lot more um, than what we've been able to do in this hour Zoom call. Um, it's available, and I would also mention there is this small network, the Play-Based Justice Network, that is working to um, develop strategies related to play-based work and particularly how that relates to a focus on anti-oppression, particularly anti-racism. So we hope that um, we can stay connected with you. I think at this time we'll turn it back over to um, Marisol to bring us to a, a close today. Sure. Thank you all. It looks like there were a couple more questions. So if you want to take a look at those before I do the closing. I answered this one. So Gavin, I just wrote that Drexel was the only program that um, had anything related to home ownership and it was still new. Um, and you, re you raised some really critical points with that. One of the, one of the questions around so Drexel's approach and all these approaches when you're focusing on place is does the university become a gentrifier? Yeah. And that is, um, there's a lot of tension there and a lot of an awareness of how the university is pursuing things. Are, is the university pursuing brick and mortar? Sort of, are they purchasing properties and doing development in that way, or is it more through social service partnerships and educational partnerships? But the awareness of the institution as a whole of those issues is really important, particularly at the higher level administration level. And Lori raises a really interesting question. Do you think it's possible to skip over student mm -hmm. development programs and launch place-based work from more of an institutional perspective? So I'm a director of a student affairs program, so I'm going to put my uh, bias out there. Um, I would say if you're not going to have student development um, or student-based programs, are you just community relations then? That would be a question that I would have. I think there's also a, a risk if we're not involving our students in these activities that um, at some point the institution will just back off and say we're no longer committed to this work. That's it's important to be pursuing kind of both, what we kind of think of as goal one and goal two, community impact, campus impact, and doing those simultaneously. There are also, and there's, I think there's a host of different ways that students can learn in a much deeper way about community context and about community change when they're focused on place and when they're understanding the history and the power dynamics um, and the natural leadership that is arises in our neighborhoods. Um, so um, it's, it, there's, uh, I think, a, a need to think creatively about how we engage our students and to probably not pursue the same, same things that we've been doing, but I think uh, important to involve our students. Well, you know, at this time, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Eric and Kent, for sharing your knowledge and experience with this topic. The case studies and the examples, I think, were very helpful in looking at place-based community engagement, the impact that it can have. Uh, not only on the institution, but also on our local communities and the ways those communities are involved in um, the process. I want to thank our attendees um, for your participation and engagement. It's so helpful when we have questions to answer and really make this webinar space a uh, space of interactive learning. Um, there will be an evaluation uh, emailed to you as well as um, the uh, slides from this uh, webinar and um, the webinar will be available on the Campus Compact website. So please make sure to fill out the evaluation. It helps us engage in uh, continuous improvement and we welcome your feedback. Um, I also wanna say thank you to Eric and Kat for raising um, the issue of uh, diversity and equity and inclusion in this work. It's something that Campus Compact is committed to and moving more and more of our programs into looking at um, the critical issues around diversity in our field and how we develop those um, leaders, um, especially given the community-based work and the communities that we're working with. Um, I'd like to close by uh, reminding folks of Campus Compact's regional conferences. So we, our first one coming up uh, for 2019 is the Continuums of Service, which, which will be March 6th through the 8th in San Diego, uh, run through our Western region. Our Eastern Regional Conference will be taking place in Providence, Rhode Island, and that takes place March 25th through 27th. And our Midwest Campus Compact Conference uh, will take place in Minneapolis, 
May 30th through um, 31st. So you can check out our website to get more information. Um, and uh, I will also encourage you to get the book, find out, read more, uh, and reach out um, to learn more about place-based community engagement. Until next time, thank you all so much for uh, your participation. Bye. Thank you, Marisol. Thank you.